Good evening. Uh, you're very welcome uh, to this year's Berlin Lecture. This year marks the completion of a remarkable literary and scholarly project, the editing of our founder, Isaiah Berlin's Letters by Henry Hardy. So it seemed a fitting year to invite our honorary fellow to give this year's Berlin Lecture. Nothing could better mark the imminent conclusion of a mighty achievement. The first volume of the letters came out in 2004. The final volume will appear later in this year of 2015. Berlin's letters are a dazzling and addictive performance, dating from 1928 to 1997, written to an amazing range of correspondence and providing a window onto the whole multifaceted life of a renowned thinker, writer and teacher, his intellectual distinction, his influence on the history of ideas in the 20th and 21st century, his social, literary, political, and academic adventures around the world, his wicked and notorious taste for gossip, his <coughs> remarkably tender and complicated interior emotional life, and his Oxford battles, plots, and successes, of which one of the most important and impressive was undoubtedly the founding fundraising for and presidency of Wolfson College. And equally impressive in its own way has been the collecting, transcribing, selecting and ordering and annotating of perhaps one of the last great epistolary collections of our times. Both enterprises fall under the title heading of the most recent third volume of the letters, Building. But Henry Hardy's editorial work on Berlin has not, of course, been confined to the editing of the letters. It has been his life's work to maintain, nourish, and develop Isaiah Berlin's reputation as an essayist, philosopher, life writer, and historian of ideas. You quite often hear it said, perhaps a touch ironically, that Isaiah has published a great deal more after his death than he did in his lifetime. A more generous way of putting this, in the words of Michael Ignatieff, Isaiah Berlin's biographer, is that Henry Hardy has performed, I quote, a prodigious feat of resurrection by means of his dedicated, transformative, and faithfully sustained act of editorial attention. It has been a life's work spanning pretty much 40 years. Henry Hardy was a philosophy student at Wolfson in the early 1970s. Finding himself in Isaiah Berlin's college, he read four essays on liberty and found himself, as he put it, transfixed, transfixed for life, as it turned out. In 1974, he asked Berlin if he could collect, re-edit, and reissue his, his essays. Though Berlin, according to his biographer, at that point no longer remembered what he had written, let alone where it had appeared, he gave his permission. And there began a 23-year editorial relationship, starting with the publication of Russian Thinkers, in 1978. From 1977 to 1990, Henry Hardy combined his editing of Berlin's papers with an editorial post at Oxford University Press. In 1988, he was appointed Isaiah Berlin's literary executor, and Berlin agreed to his editing the letters. And after Isaiah Berlin's death, Henry Hardy became a member of the Isaiah Berlin Literary Trust. He has been successively a research fellow, a supernumerary fellow, and now an honorary fellow of Wolfson College, where a great part of his editorial work has been done. Of course, such mighty projects require collaborators, backers, and assistants. And the first names which spring to mind here at Wolfson as supporting Henry Hardy's life's work are those of Serena Moore, sadly not here tonight, Peter and Martine Halban, the late Pat Dutekin, Jennifer Holmes, Mark Pottle, and the late and grievously missed John Storworthy. But Henry Hardy has been Isaiah Berlin's chief immortalizer. Although I think I can guess who is the genius and who is the pedant in the title of his talk, I want to preempt him, I want to preempt him by saying that there is, too, a kind of genius inherent in the work of an outstanding editor which should not be undervalued and which we celebrate tonight. Please make him very welcome. Thank you, President. Uh, I've uh, listened to presidents of this college try and make uh, um, 
silk purses out of Saudi, Saudi ears for 40 years, and Hermione does it with more charm and grace than any of her predecessors. <laughs> um, so I'm very grateful for that. I'm just going to set this timer, which told me when I'm running out of time, at least I hope it will. And I also need to tell you that um, Hardy's Law, which is a law of information technology, has been vindicated yet again on this occasion. Hardy's Law uh, arises originally out of Murphy's Law, which says that if anything can go wrong, it will, via Kelly's Law, which says Murphy was an optimist. <laughs> And Hardy's law says that when it comes to information technology, Kelly was an optimist. <laughs> the problem here is that the modern digital HDMI connection, which uh, enables the top quality sound reproduction that this wonderful lecture room is capable of, is not working properly. And the uh, slides and audio recordings and video recordings and so on jump unpredictably. So they've had to connect it to the old fashioned um, analog system and the quality of the sound will not be quite so good. I hope it'll be okay because when struggling not only with that but with the fact that Isaiah Berlin's voice of which you're going to hear a good deal is itself slightly difficult to follow at the best of times. But uh, I've done my best and I hope it's okay. I've, I've provided subtitles um, for those who find his voice difficult so with any luck uh, you'll be able to follow what's going on even if the sound itself just seems like structureless mumbling. What is a genius? I find the official definition seriously wanting. The Oxford English Dictionary defines a genius as an exceptionally intelligent or talented person. In other words, genius is an ordinary ability possessed to an extraordinary degree. But this surely isn't right. For me, a genius can do something quite different from us ordinary mortals. Different in kind, not just in degree. I am convinced that Isaiah Berlin was a genius of a kind. Before I explain why, let me tell you what he himself had to say about genius, which was a category that fascinated him. One of his favourite definitions was taken from the ballet dancer Václav Lijinsky, a man of canonical genius. I'm going to display quotations on the screen so that it's clear when I'm quoting without having to say, quote, unquote. So here we go for the first one. Berlin wrote, I'm sometimes asked what I mean by this highly evocative but imprecise term. In answer, I can say only this. The dancer Dijinsky was once asked how he managed to leap so high. He is reported to have answered that he saw no great problem in this. Most people, when they leapt in the air, came down at once. Why should you come down immediately? Stay in the air a little before you return. Why not? He is reported to have said. One of the criteria of genius seems to me to be the power to do something perfectly simple and visible, which ordinary people cannot and know that they cannot do, nor do they know how it is done or why they cannot begin to do it. Now, defying gravity is not leaping higher than the rest of us. It's doing something the rest of us can't do at all in any degree. Never mind that Lijinsky couldn't, of course, actually defy gravity. He seemed to, and therein displayed his genius. take the single step from the sublime to the ridiculous, you may remember that Walt Disninsky emulated Nijinsky in his 1940 film Fantasia. <laughs> the 
More broadly, Berlin used to say that genius created new possibilities that didn't exist before. Here he is talking about the great Russian poet Anna Akhmatova, whom he met in Leningrad in 1945. I was suddenly in the presence of a poet of genius who revealed feelings, thoughts, forms of life, which I never could have understood if they hadn't been. And suddenly, one's imagination was enormously widened by the mere fact that this person existed. He also gave us some clues to the presence of genius, some symptoms in oneself of encountering it. In particular, talking to a person of genius makes one's mind race. Boris Pasternak was a genius of this kind. He talked mildly. He talked like a genius. I was completely overwhelmed. I saw at last I met a man of authentic genius. And he felt the same about an English writer whom he compared to Pasternak in this respect. The only other person who seems to me to have talked as he talked was Virginia Woolf, who, to judge from the few occasions on which I met her, made one's mind race as he did and obliterated one's normal vision of reality in the same exhilarating and at times terrifying way. He used to say something similar too about the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. Here are two instances. Wittgenstein was a man of genius and he really did uh, excite people in one way. I felt I was in the presence of a very demanding genius. His genius was obvious. The examples were wonderful. Half a mo, half a mo, I won't think of an example. And here is what he said about another philosophical genius, J.L. Austin. The interjections of agreement are from his interlocutor, Stuart Hampshire. He was certainly yes. the ablest person I ever knew intimately among philosophers. Yes. When he was alone with one, he was marvellous to talk with, because he didn't insist on one translating one's own language into his language or some particularly official language into which everything had to be translated. He understood what one said perfectly, uh, talked about it with extreme acuteness and lucidity, and made one's thoughts race. Talking to Berlin made one's thoughts race too and made one feel more intelligent than one knew oneself to be. He was a catalyst of intellectual excellence in those who encountered him, which for me is another crit criterion of genius. He also made you feel that you were the only person who mattered to him while he spoke to you, as many have testified. He made the world of the mind intensely alive, important, exhilarating and fun in a way that was quite new to me when I first met him. He used to define an intellectual as someone who wants ideas to be as interesting as possible. And that definition provides part of the answer to those who ask why he was and is so celebrated. I would defy anyone to name someone who better exemplified the second part of what the French woman of letters Madame de Staël said of her contemporary Jean-Jacques Rousseau and which Berlin quoted in 1952. Rousseau said nothing new, but set everything on fire. Only the second part, because Berlin did say new things, which puts him ahead of Rousseau on that count, if de Staël is right, which I doubt. <laughs> One last definition of genius that Berlin offered is that it is the ability to turn a paradox into a platitude. That, too, is a test Berlin himself passes, in my view, with his celebrated claim that ultimate human values and the cultures they compose are irreducibly plural and sometimes incommensurable. But it would take me too far afield to try to justify my assessment of this claim here. The personalities of most geniuses of the past are preserved only on paper, which means that it's hard to convey the nature of their genius in a vivid manner. Fortunately, there are numerous audio and video recordings of Berlin, and it's possible to cull from these suggestive evidence of his own particular form of genius. Before I try to convey further what this was, let me show you Berlin in full flow. It's hard to choose a representative example from the many possibilities, but I think it would be difficult to beat a passage from an interview conducted nearly 40 years ago with our own 
Brian McGee happily with us here today, in which Berlin agrees with McGee's suggestion that philosophical questions are like questions asked by children. Children ask these questions with our elders. They say, um, they don't say what is time, they don't say that. But what they say is, uh, why can't I live to Berlin? Supposing a child says that, it seems quite a natural thing to a child to do. And you say, you can't, he's dead. And then you say, well, why, why, is this, why does this prevent one? And then they say, well, this sophisticated, has to explain that death means uh, his body becomes dissolved uh, in the ground, he can't be resurrected, kept a long time ago. Um, and, and then if the child is at all sophisticated, the sophisticated child would say, well, can't all the bits be brought together again? And then the father said, no, they can't. What kind of can't? And then a lesson in physics follows. And the child said, no, I don't really want that. I don't want to put him now. I want to go back to the, see him as he was at the Battle of Austerlitz. That's what I like. Well, you can't, says the father. Why not? Because you can't move back in time. Why can't I? Then we have a philosophical problem. What is meant by can't? Is not being able to move back in time the same sort of can't as when you say twice two can't be seven? Or the same sort of count as when you say uh, you can't buy cigarettes at two o'clock in the morning because of the law against it. <coughs> or I can't remember. Or uh, I, I can't make myself nine foot tall by merely wishing it. What sort of can't? What sort of must? And then we're plunged into philosophy straight away. And then you have to say, well, the nature of time. And then some people will say, no, no, there isn't such a thing as time. Time is just a word for before and after. And simultaneously with, to talk about time as if it was a kind of thing, is a metaphysical trap. And we're launched. Well, most our fathers don't want to answer questions. They're not ask any questions. It's going to answer But these are questions which constantly recur, and the philosophers are the people who are not terrified of them and are prepared to deal with them. The children, of course, are ultimately conditioned to not asking these questions. More is the pity. The children who are not very conditioned turn to the philosophers. <laughs> So what was Berlin's genius? If I had to sum it up in a phrase, I should say that it was a genius for humanity, for being a human being. A human being of a certain kind, naturally, no one can be all things to all men. The kind of human that Berlin was a genius at being was one centrally concerned with ideas, with the life of the mind, but not only that. A human being with other characteristics too, more or less unconnected with his intellectual concerns but ones which also contributed to his genius. Berlin's particular genius was an accumulation of separate strands, none decisive by itself, but all simultaneously present in all that he did and was, especially in the way he thought and talked, creating a whole greater than the sum of its parts, a whole that was arresting in the requisite way. Some of these strands were incisive intelligence, strikingly direct and intense engagement with the topic at hand, unflaggingly benign good humour and accentuation of the positive, seeing the point of people rather than cutting them down to size, effortless wideness of reference over a huge range, extraordinary fluency in conversation and writing, and a 19th century command of language, free from all empty critical jar jargon or management speak. Pages stuck together. No talk of narrative or discourse or robust measures or transparency. Sharp perceptiveness about human nature in general and the nature of specific individuals. Utter lack of self importance. I may be wrong. These are my views of what they're worth. But I don't see myself as a person of much importance. And this is not false notes. This is the final component of his genius I shall enumerate is first-handedness, by which I mean the absence, as he used to put it, of others, of anything between him and the object. He said this about the Russian critic Vissarion Belinsky, about Lord David Cecil, about Stephen Spender, about Ludwig Wittgenstein. This close contact with his subject matter brings to mind Schiller's distinction between the two types of poets that he called naive and sentimental. In Berlin's paraphrase, The poets were not conscious of any rift 
between themselves and their milieu, or any of it within themselves. And, on the other hand, writers in general, and poets in particular, who are conscious of this. Berlin's directness of vision and comparative lack of self-consciousness make him, for me, more naive than sentimental. This is paradoxical, given that he deploys the distinction himself in a celebrated essay of 1968, uh, entitled The Naivety of Verdi, from which the clip I have just played you comes. Paradoxical, because the ability to distinguish the naive from the sentimental might be thought possible only for the sentimental, just as people without colour vision might be thought unable to contrast their own way of seeing with ours. Nevertheless, my placing of Berlin in the naive camp, in this special sense, seems to me to be right. Far from naive as he was in the ordinary sense. Let me return for a moment to the first quality I mentioned, Berlin's intelligence, and make it more specific. I should not claim that Berlin was the most intelligent person I've ever met. But he had a special intellectual ability that he himself described in 1944 in a letter, as seeing a pattern on the carpet. The American historian George Kennan captured this ability well in a letter he wrote to Berlin in 1958. You have unquestionably the greatest critical mind of this generation, warmed with a charity that might well be the envy of 99 out of 100 Christians, and enriched with an ordering power so extraordinary that its mere operation is itself a creative act affecting that which it touches, and even changing it, just as scientific experimentation is said to alter by its own action the substance it is supposed to illuminate. I cannot begin to explain this power, but I can certainly confirm that Berlin had it. One way in which it manifested itself was that he grasped what you were going to say almost as soon as you began saying it, as well as what the next several conversational moves were going to be. As so often, he recognised his own qualities in others, in this case, in Maynard Keynes. You shall the language. In you, contented your sense of good speech, always will get it. In his written work, too, Berlin saw to the heart of a mass of detail with a preternatural acuteness that has never ceased to amaze me. There's another paradox here, because he was also fascinated by inconsequential detail for its own sake, especially the idiosyncratic detail of people's lives and characters. When I walk the street, I like to at people's faces. Too much so. Sometimes I start staring. They don't like it. But I like to shake my heads, the expression of their faces, as there was a German poet in New Zealand during the war who was asked what kind of um, um, landscapes do like this. He said, human beings are my landscape. Entirely true of me. The poet was the German Jew Karl Wolfscale. And Berlin wrote to a friend in 1968, like a bad encyclopedia, I'm always trying to pepper people with a mass of trivial and obscure small facts which merely clutter up the memory gratuitously. <laughs> and to a young admirer who wrote to him out of the blue in 1996, the year before he died, I am fascinated by the vagaries of your life. <laughs> this propensity helps to explain his taste for gossip, though it should be added that in his case the gossip was mostly benign, if not exclusively so. But it was not only people who caught his attention. He loved gadgets and bric-a-brac too, and was often seduced by junk shop windows into stepping inside and making bizarre purchases. Here is James Douglas, husband of the anthropologist Mary Douglas, remembering tutorials with Berlin at New College before the war. He kept an odd collection of things which he had bought off the street traders who in those days sold things from the pavement in Regent Street, and also a magnificent gramophone with a handmade papier-mâché trumpet, the then current equivalent of today's <coughs> high-fidelity equipment. As I would read my essay to him, he would wander around the room toying with his collection, a toy cow would fall off an inclined plane. I'm so sorry, please continue. A blast of Verdi would emerge from the gramophone's trumpet as he accidentally dropped the needle on the disc. I'm so sorry, please continue. <laughs> Berlin's attraction to unrepeatable detail is connected to his resistance to scientism 
which is the assimilation of all disciplines to the model of the natural sciences, which in turn he saw as predominantly concerned with what things and events have in common rather than with what makes them unique. But at the same time, he was preoccupied with questions located at the other extreme of human affairs, especially the most general questions of morals and politics, which he often poses in resonant monosyllables. What is to be done? How should one live? Why are we here? What must we be and do? Our answers to these questions are rooted in our conception of human nature, in our answer to the question, what is man? And all Berlin's work can be seen as an inquiry into this most fundamental of all human issues, however varied that work may seem. This was one reason why I called the last book by him published in his lifetime, an anthology of his best essays, The Proper Study of Mankind. Oddly enough, there were gaps in his interest between the two extremes of personal specificities and human generalities, and one of these was day-to-day -day politics, curiosity about which he disclaimed. I was never interested in politics, as such, despite being prepared for it. Politics was not the centre of my thought. I wasn't interested in day-to-day -day events. I was more interested in what might be called standard in the more permanent aspects of the human world. That last phrase, the more permanent aspects of the human world, well describes the focus of his thought, even though his inquiries into it were usually conducted in terms of the kaleidoscope of particularity that it generates. Indeed, it seems to me that a case can be made for saying that his combination of eagle-eyed absorption in the absolutely specific and an exceptional instinct for the general truths that lie beneath is one of the main roots of his genius. There was depth in his concern with surfaces. Into the life of this genius in 1972, when the genius was 63, entered a wonderfully fortunate 22-year-old pedant who stands before you now, a few years older than his victim was when he first encountered him. In this case, the dictionary definition is nearer the mark. A pedant is one who is excessively concerned with accuracy over trifling details of knowledge. <laughs> I use the term with some irony, of course, with British self-deprecation, Accuracy is quite rightly a key value in scholarly activity, whether scientific or humanistic, and accuracy over trifling details can be an indispensable foundation of accuracy over what is more important. Take care of the semicolons and the sentences will find it easier to take care of themselves. So a determination to be accurate is worth cultivating. What is more, Berlin believed in accuracy strongly, even though he was not notably good at achieving it. Yeah, very, very pedantic thing to say about yeah. that he was right. And he wrote to me, I long for accuracy, even pedantry. <laughs> facts are facts, he would say, when mistakes were pointed out, or truth is truth. Maybe his tendency towards inaccuracy was a blessing in disguise, because an obsession with accuracy can act as a break on creativity, a clogging of the arteries through which the creative juices flow. But in Berlin's case, it also gave the pedant plenty of work to do. This particular pedant, like many pedants, also exhibited a more general tendency to be obsessive. One form that his obsessiveness took was a taste for detailed textual editing, for ensuring that a text was presented just so, so that all possible barriers were removed that might interfere with its impact on the reader. Clumsy punctuation, unclarity of expression, distracting ugliness of typographical design. But there was also an echo in his temperament of Berlin's simultaneous interest in the particular and the universal. The particularities that engaged the pedant were the duller ones of scholarly accuracy, but the generalities were similar in both cases. 
since both genius and pedant had the kind of childish philosophical bent that longs to know the answers to the ultimate questions of human life. And both were dissatisfied with the tendency in some philosophical quarters to dismiss such questions as ill-conceived or even meaningless. The pedant first met the genius at a scholarship interview in Wilson. Let me now move to the first person. Not only did I come to know Berlin well personally, since he was enormously present and available in college, but I soon discovered that he was famous for non-publication. As his friend Maurice Bauer memorably expressed it when Berlin was awarded the Order of Merit in 1971, though like our Lord and Socrates he does not publish much, he thinks and says a great deal and has, an enormous, has had an enormous influence on our time. The true situation was a bit more complex. In fact, Berlin had many publications in his name, but they were almost all obscurely published lectures, essays, and reviews, not books, and most of them hadn't been collected in volume form. He had published only one proper book, an intellectual biography of Karl Marx, but that had appeared long ago, in 1939. To exhibit my pedantry for a moment, if anybody can tell me why a silhouette of the chapel of King's College, Cambridge, appears on the title page, I shall be grateful. <laughs> Since Karl Marx, there had been only one collection of essays. The, the book he regarded as his most important, Four Essays on Liberty, published in 1969. A Wolfsonian friend who knew of my somewhat eccentric interest in editing suggested to me that Berlin was an especially suitable case for treatment. I had not at that point read any of his works, so I devoured four essays on liberty and was completely bowled over. Here was a writer and thinker of, yes, genius, I realised, whose work ought to be made as widely available as possible. He addressed the same fundamental questions that had long absorbed me, and his conception of humanity struck me as spot on, more telling than anything I had encountered before. His key values were freedom and variety, which included irresponsibility and frivolity, as well as more serious components. And he linked the two in convincingly important ways. As his friend Noel Annan later put it, he seems to me to have written the truest and the most moving of all the interpretations of life that my own generation made. In due course, I asked Berlin if I might prepare an edition of his essays. He had previously refused a number of similar requests, but because I was a Wolfsonian, and because he was always supportive of Wolfsonians in whatever crazy ambition they nurtured, he agreed, though not without deep misgivings. These were based both on sincere scepticism about the value of his work and on the view that collected essays should properly appear posthumously. Indeed, he always referred to my editions as his posthumous writings. To cut a long and for you wearisome story short, I edited four volumes of his essays in the late 1970s, one of them jointly with another Wolfsonian, the Russianist Aileen Kelly. The volumes were widely and enthusiastically reviewed and by common consent transformed Berlin's reputation. Berlin himself acknowledged this, which naturally gave me satisfaction. It was well thought of. I think one great admirer is a source of great satisfaction. And here he is answering a question about what his reputation is based on. I think my writings. I think these subversive writings which really take. That's what really gave me such reputation as I did. All these little paper volumes which Henry Harvey has kind of collected of all kinds of obscure articles published in pretty unknown periodicals. That's what created a certain outlook, gave me a position. I thought that was it, but in 1988, Berlin asked me to be one of his literary executors, and I in turn asked to inspect the material with which I should have to deal in this role. I searched his home from attic to cellar, and was astonished to discover large quantities of finished but unpublished material. I asked to start work immediately in his lifetime while he was available to answer questions. 
Since I knew him to be a prolific and engaging correspondent, I proposed as part of my task preparing an edition of his letters, which some believed would prove to be his most important work. And I wanted to start collecting these letters immediately before they started to disappear. Again, he was reluctant, but again, he at last agreed. And so it was that in 1990, I started full-time work on his papers, based once more here in Wolfson. A further four volumes appeared before his death in 1997, and seven more afterwards, together with the four-volume edition of his letters, whose final instalment appears this coming September, jointly edited by my redoubtable fellow Wolfsonian fellow, Mark Pottle, and with the indispensable assistance of Nicholas Hall. Most of the fine detail of editorial work is not a gripping topic for a public lecture, though this work is not without its parochial excitements. In Berlin's case, a central task was tracking down his many ostensible quotations to their source so that they could be properly referenced and corrected if necessary. These alleged quotations were often approximate or frankly inaccurate many of them loosely translated from the foreign languages in which they were written, and some of them attributed to the wrong author, or to the wrong work by the right author, or to no particular author at all. Nor had Berlin always kept an accurate record of where they came from. The era of online texts and email was some way off when I began work, so that progress was frustratingly slow. It entailed many hours in libraries and the consultation by snail mail of experts of all kinds in many parts of the globe. Rather than going into this tedious process any further, I should like to touch on a special feature of Berlin's quotations, which is that their looseness often improves them radically. Let me give you just three examples. In 1784... Immanuel Kant wrote what appears on the screen, which a native German speaker will now pronounce for us since I dare not attempt this myself. <laughs> Literally translated, this says, from such crooked wood as that from which man is made, Nothing wholly straight can be carpentered. Berlin's usual version, he is gloriously inconsistent in all things, as enunciated by him exactly 50 years ago, is this. A crooked timber for humanity, no straight thing was ever made. <laughs> Only because he transformed it in this way has this become a famous quotation, which you will find in the Oxford Dictionary of Quotations. It also provided the title for one of my editions of his essays, The Crooked Timber of Humanity. The second quotation is from Trotsky, who wrote the Russian sentence that appears on the screen, again read by our multilingual cantor. <laughs> A literal translation might run, those of our contemporaries who demand of history above all calm and comfort have chosen a bad fatherland in time. This Berlin again transformed into anyone desiring a quiet life has done badly to be born in the 20th century. <laughs> which he used as an epigraph to the first of the four essays on liberty. The last quotation is from the 20th century American pragmatist philosopher C.I. Lewis, who wrote, If the truth should be complex and somewhat disillusioning, it would still not be a merit to substitute for it some more dramatic and comforting simplicity. Berlin often quoted this, again in various versions, all very distant from the wording of the original. Here is one of them. There is no a priori reason for supposing that the truth, once discovered, will necessarily prove interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Much better, even though wildly inaccurate. 
Even as paraphrase, it goes beyond what Lewis actually wrote. The editing of Berlin's letters has been even more demanding. The range of his allusions is astonishing. And by contrast with his essays, thousands of personal names had to be footnoted, as did the events that are mentioned or taken for granted as contextual background. These events sometimes form the subject matter of individual footnotes, and other times they are summarised in passages of linking editorial commentary that Berlin called connective tissue. Some of these events, events and some of the people Berlin refers to proved extremely elusive. And occasionally I and my co-editors have been defeated. More often, sheer bloody-minded persistence, relentless badgering of experts, and in more recent years, obsessive Googling won the day. Mark Pottle, co-editor of the last two volumes of Letters, and I coined the term iceberg note to refer to a note that is deceptively brief and clear, concealing a large mass of head-banging under the surface. <laughs> With hindsight, I wish I had been able to begin detailed work on the letters in Berlin's lifetime so that I could have asked him about the more obscure allusions. I've now spent more than 40 years on and off editing Berlin, and I don't regret a minute of it. People sometimes ask how I can have endured such a narrow focus and such a parasitic one. The incredulity that underlies such inquiries strikes me as absurd. Does anyone ask such questions about lives spent studying Jesus of Nazareth or the prophet Muhammad? I'm not, of course, implying that Berlin was to any degree a prophet, despite his given name, let alone divine, but I do say that Jesus and Muhammad were human beings. However this may be, so long as the object of one's interest has sufficient riches to offer, I see no problem in training one's attention on him or her. In amongst the drudgery of these years, there have been many moments of unpredictable excitement, revelation, and sheer fun. I should like to share a couple of them with you. One task that has stretched over many years is the accumulation of copies of all the surviving recordings of Berlin, clips from which you've already seen and heard. The first surviving recording of Berlin's voice is a lecture on Rousseau given in 1952 on BBC Radio's third programme, now Radio 3. We have heard him quoting Madame de Stael in that lecture, and here he is delivering a phrase that has long appeared under his name in the Oxford Dictionary of Quotations because it was quoted in the Observer at the time. He is the first militant lowbrow of history, <laughs> and people like Carlyle and to some extent Nietzsche Certainly, Lawrence, D.H. Lawrence, and petty bourgeois dictators like Hitler and Mussolini are natural descendants of Rousseau. His first appearance on television was recorded seven years later in 1959, when he was asked to provide a cameo for a programme about the BBC called This is the BBC. He was filmed in a studio pretending to give a lecture on the 19th century Russian intelligentsia that he had, in fact, delivered five years earlier. This is the BBC third programme. This evening, Sir Isaiah Berlin gives the second of four talks. Perhaps I ought to say something about this body of men. Its enemies talked about it as a body of feckless young men who talk too much and no fixed employment and were generally parasites upon society. Only one thing wasn't allowed, and that is to be a philistine. In the credits at the end of this programme, which was initially screened only in cinemas, Berlin was sandwiched between Cliff Mitchellmore and the George Mitchell singers <laughs> <laughs> over the strains of the folk song Early One Morning. This may have contributed to his refusal to allow the use of his brief appearance in the version of the film that was subsequently shown on TV. 
he had a horror of being seen as a sort of circus intellectual and had heard reports that his appearance in the film looked a trifle undignified. Quite wrongly, in my view. The BBC had to substitute clips of the poet and critic John Lehman giving a talk at considerable expense. The TV version was in black and white, since colour TV was not then available. Five years later, he made his first genuine appearance on television in a conversation with A.J. Eyre and J.B. Priestley at a simulated dinner party in which smoke from cigarettes and cigars played a leading role. Here is a clip. Supposing I paint in oil sort of computer air, in which machine is brought it up, conditioned us, taught us where we were asleep, told us what to eat, what to drink, stopped our antisocial activities, worked on groups of drill, and produced absolutely uh, smooth functioning, not unhappy, race of human beings, meshing with each other in perfect harmony and peace. And supposing I said to you, well, these people wouldn't suffer from anxieties, they wouldn't suffer from practically divided counsel as we do, they wouldn't have temptations, they wouldn't have any aggressive instincts, they kick it over. In a perfectly good way, what is horrifying about this? In 1957, before either of these films was made, he gave a radio lecture on political judgment, in which effectively he described the way in which the humanist differed from the scientist. This distinction was one of Berlin's recurrent and most important themes. He strongly believed in science, and this belief, under, uh, this belief underlay his enthusiasm for the initial scientific bias of Wolfson. But he was also implacably opposed, as I've said, to the aping of scientific methodology by the humanities, the elimination of the particular in favour of the general. His description in this talk of the gift needed by the successful politician seems to me to capture this opposition well. The gift we need entails above all a capacity for integrating a vast amalgam of constantly changing, multicolored, evanescent, perpetually overlapping data, too many, too swift, too intermingled to be caught and pinned down and labeled like so many individual butterflies. To seize a situation in this sense, one needs to see, to be given a kind of direct, almost sensuous contact with the relevant data. That which makes such writers as, say, Tolstoy or Proust convey a sense of direct acquaintance with the texture of life, not just the sense of a chaotic flow of experience, but a highly developed discrimination of what matters from the rest, whether from the point of view of the writer or of the characters he describes. It's a sense for what is qualitative rather than quantitative, for what is specific rather than general. It's a species of direct acquaintance as opposed to a capacity for description, or calculation, or inference. It is what is sometimes called natural wisdom, what is called imaginative understanding, insight, perceptiveness, and what is much more misleadingly called intuition, which suggests, and suggests very dangerously, some supernatural faculty. These things, as opposed to very different virtues, very great as these may be, but different, such as theoretical learning, or theoretical knowledge, erudition, powers of reading, intellectual genius. I now turn to Berlin's letters. The search for these was long and often frustrating. One of the most serendipitous finds was of two letters he wrote in the mid-1930s to his friend, the German lawyer, Adam von Trott, who was gruesomely hung with piano wire in 1944 for his part in a famous plot to assassinate Hitler. Brief excerpts from these letters had been tantalisingly quoted in a biography of Trott by Christopher Sykes. Naturally, I wanted to track the letters down, but Berlin told me, I think more in hope than on any evidential basis, that Sykes had subsequently lost or discarded them. I was reluctant to accept that they had disappeared, but initially got nowhere in my attempts to unearth them. Then my friend Joshua Chernis of Balliol was kindly checking various works on Trot for me and, and discovered that parts of the same passages were quoted in a thesis written after Sykes's biography was published by a man named Henry O. Malone. Josh was electrified, as was I, to discover that Malone's quotations differed in crucial details from Sykes's, 
in ways that couldn't be put down to miscopying from sight. So, might Malone have complete texts of the letters, or even the letters themselves? Was he still alive? Eventually, I tracked him down to his home in Virginia. His memories of his work on Trot were unreliable after many intervening years, but he didn't think he had ever had the letters in his possession. However, his old Trot papers were in his garage, and he'd look through them when time allowed. After what seemed a long, long delay, he announced that he had found the original letters in a folder borrowed many years before from Trot's widow, to whom it had after all been returned by Sykes. Later, one of Malone's daughters brought the letters over on a trip to Oxford. I took copies and sent them to join the Trot archive in Koblenz, and they duly appear in the first volume of the letters edition. How careless people were with irreplaceable originals in the days before photocopying and later scanning became universal. From Virginia to County Galway. In 1933, and again in three subsequent years, Berlin went on a motoring holiday with three friends to Ireland. The friends were Christopher Cox, an ancient historian at New College, Mary Fisher, daughter of Herbert Fisher, warden of New College, later Mary Bennett, principal of St Hilda's, and Moira Lind, a pupil of Berlin's. The women were both of striking appearance, if one is allowed to say this, Mary on the left, Moira on the right. Mary took a camera, and Berlin and Cox took pictures with it. Here they are with their car, without Berlin, who took the photo, but with the Countess Metaxa, a friend of Cox's on the right. One of their ports of call was a small island in a lake owned by the Countess. Here is a photo taken by Cox, showing the others at the jetty on the island, with the rowing boat used to get there. Note the structure of the boat, the angle in the concrete jetty, the tussocks in the water, and the shape of the mountain behind. Nearly 80 years later, in 2011, I found myself in County Galway and went to look for the site of this repeated holiday. I found a likely boathouse, which had accidentally been left unlocked. Opening the door, I saw before me the very boat I knew from the photos. I felt as if I was in a time machine. I left a note for the owners, who later contacted me and invited me to visit the island, which I did on a subsequent visit to Galway. Everything was just the same, apart from a rampant growth of rhododendrons, the boat, the angle in the jetty, the hill and tussocks. Here are the shacks on the island in the 1930s. Here is Berlin's photo of his companions taking tea in the main shack in 1934. And here, is, and here is the same shack in 2011, again with added flora. It was a magical experience. From County Galway to Falmer in Sussex. In 2002, the author Michael Wolfers, whom I was consulting about various persons mentioned by Berlin in his letters, drew my attention to the Harmon Grisewood papers at Georgetown University. These unexpectedly yielded a poor copy of a fascinating photograph of Berlin shaving in a mirror held by his friend Lady Prudence Pelham. <coughs> Where was the original? Georgetown didn't know, but suggested that I ask Thomas Dilworth, an authority on Prudence's friend David Jones, the Welsh poet. Dilworth thought the photo might be in the National Library of Wales, which houses Jones's papers. It wasn't. Next, he suggested that Jones might have been shown it by Teddy Hodgkin, friend of both Jones and Pelham. Bingo. Hodgkin not only had the photo, but thought that he had taken it himself in about 1936. His original print, despite its greenish tint, was clearer than the Georgetown copy, as becomes more evident when one removes the colour and showed that the Georgetown copy had been cropped on three sides. As you can see, there were still some scratches and other marks, 
but after expert attention from a designer, the image was healed. It seems to me an unusually eloquent photograph, but maybe I'm influenced by having travelled such a tortuous path to its discovery. <laughs> my final magic moment occurred when I was lying in my bath one Sunday evening listening to Berlin's favourite radio channel, Classic FM. Before I tell you what I heard, let me remind you of what must be the best-known story about Berlin. In 1944, Winston Churchill invited the songwriter Irving Berlin to lunch at 10 Downing Street, under the impression that Irving was Isaiah. <laughs> he knew about Isaiah because he had read and admired the wartime dispatches from the British Embassy in Washington reporting on American politics. Irving was in London and had made a donation to a wartime charity supported by Mrs Churchill, who wanted her husband to thank him. But Churchill insisted on having him to lunch and didn't discover his mistake until the end of the meal, during which some comical exchanges not unnaturally took place. Anyway, lying in my bath, I suddenly heard an Irving Berlin song I'd never heard before, and the lyrics immediately spoke to me. My British buddy, we're as different as can be. He thinks he's winning the war, and I think it's me. <laughs> this summed up for me the whole business of bringing America into the war, as well as echoing Churchill's confusion. It also reminded me of what Berlin wrote at the time in a letter to Moira Lind. I wish to help to win the war. Here's Irving Berlin himself singing the song. My British buddy, we're as different as can be. He thinks he's winning the war, and I think it's me. By this stage in a lecture, at the very latest, concentration is flagging, eyelids are drooping, and the prospect of a glass of wine is ever more enticing. So I'm going to suppress the last few minutes of what I was going to subject you to and play us out with a musical portrait of Berlin that lasts for only half a minute. I have to admit that I am the composer and also that I wrote it at the age of 16, eight years before I met Berlin. As to how that is possible, I leave you to guess. <laughs> Henry Hardy started his brilliant, funny and endearing lecture tonight by talking about people. Nijinsky, Wittgenstein, Virginia Woolf, Madame de Staal, and with evocations of the racing mind, the mind on fire, and evocations of ways of speaking. You might have thought, perhaps, before you came here, uh, that the editorial process and the editorial personality could be something rather dry, clinical, technical, but you, can tell, you could tell at once and all through this talk that this obsessive pedant <laughs> is also profoundly interested in humanity, humaneness, human nature. This talk went with emotion to the heart of a creative life, right to the quick of it. A human being is the editor's landscape too, as well as his subjects. Berlin's interview with Brian McGee, that amazing performance, has the child asking his father about the dead Napoleon. Can't all the bits 
be brought together again. That's what Henry Hardy does in his editorial work, and that's what he's done here tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you.